I wanted in this uh, session this afternoon to <clears throat> try and bring things down to a practical level in terms of uh, organizational change, redeeming the structures. And fortunately, there is in Scripture a blueprint uh, that God has given us to follow. And if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, as I said before, is the rebuilding of the city. Ezra, which preceded it, <clears throat> was the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah chapter 1. In the month of Kislev, <clears throat> in the twentieth year, when I was in the citadel of Susa, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the captivity and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. <clears throat> the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. The first step as far as the rescue of the city is concerned <clears throat> is care for the city. A book by uh, John Greenleaf, quite a remarkable book called Servant Leadership. I'd recommend you read it uh, if you see it around. It's a secular book, but it's a uh, brilliant book in many ways. Greenleaf says the problem with our society today is that nobody loves the institutions. That's fair enough, isn't it? Whoever loved a bank <coughs> or an oil company. Care is love in action. See, there are two kinds of love. There's emotional love, that's love of the feelings. And there's volitional love, that's love of the will. Emotional love is of very little moral value. <coughs> it is something that happens to you rather than something you do. And sometimes it can fool us into believing we're loving, sympathetic people because we're easily moved to tears at the sight of starving children. If we do nothing to help those starving children, what value is the emotion? Very little, if any. The other kind of love is love of the will. That's a chosen response regardless of feelings. Very important as far as leaders are concerned. <coughs> Often I find Christian leaders struggle in their churches because they can't generate loving feelings for all their congregation. They're not meant to. <laughs> feelings are something that happens to us, not something you do. When uh, Jesus said, I'm to love my neighbor, he doesn't say I'm to love my neighbor the way I love my wife, or the way I love my best friend, or the way I love my children. I'm to love my neighbor the way I love myself. I don't know about you, but I never have warm, gushy feelings about myself, ever. <laughs> Never look in the mirror in the morning and go, oh, goose pimples, you lovely man. Despite that lack of feelings, I observe I take quite good care of myself. Eh? That's the way I'm meant to love my neighbor. That's the way leaders are meant to love their people, to care for their best interests as faithfully and as consistently as they do their own. That's the way we're meant to love the city, to care for it. You can tell by the physical environment of places in a city whether people care for it or not, can't you? <clears throat> you see a place that's run down and depressed, the streets run tidy, there's rubbish lying around everywhere, there's an there's, uh, unkempt look about it, people not caring for their surroundings here. In a place where people care, like, love the place, they care for it here. We've got to learn to care for the city. We have to feel towards the city, our attitude to the city should be the same as the Jews towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem, if I forget you, let my right hand forget its cunning, let my tongue cleave to the roof of its mouth, if I do not put you above all my greatest joys. Now, do we feel like that about the city? If we don't feel like that about the city, we're unlikely to do much redemptive towards the city. We need to learn to care for the city. Nehemiah cared for Jerusalem. When he heard the news of Jerusalem's condition, he wept and mourned and fasted, for days before the Lord. That's the first step. Secondly, <clears throat> pray for the city. If 
You read Nehemiah's prayer <clears throat> from verse uh, 4 through to verse 9. Wonderful prayer worth reading. <clears throat> Two important points I want you to notice about Nehemiah's prayer. <clears throat> One, that he confessed the sins of the city. And if we're going to change the city, we need to confess its city, its uh, guilt rather, its sins. You know why? Because we are guilty. Okay. The sins of the city are corporate sins. The rebellion of the city is corporate rebellion. The guilt of the city is corporate guilt. We share in the corporate life of the city, therefore we are corporately guilty along with the city. See? Never think if you're confessing the sins of the city as an innocent person, you're vicariously confessing the sins of other people. You're not. You're confessing your own sins. See? We share in the guilt of the city. And that, <clears throat> that, that has to be the motivation that drives our, uh, drives our confession. The city, by its very nature, is anti-God. It's rebellious. Full of violence, Luxury, the occult, oppression, injustice, all that sort of thing. We share in that guilt, eh? because it's corporate guilt. Secondly, in Nehemiah's prayer, <clears throat> he is willing to be the answer to, your, to, to his own prayer. you start praying about recovering the city, the likelihood God say, right, go do it. And we have to, be the will have to be willing to be the answers to our own prayers. Sometimes it's a very good idea, actually. I've prayed for years for my wife that God would give her a husband. God answered it by prayer. He said, you. Wonderful. But our, in our <coughs> intercession, there has to be that willingness to be say, Lord, here am I, send me. Not here am I, send my sister. <laughs> Number three, plan for the city. I discovered that between Nehemiah's prayer in Nehemiah 1, and Nehemiah's appearance before the king in Nehemiah chapter 2, there's actually a period of four months. Nehemiah didn't just spend a few days praying before God and to burst into the king's presence with all the, everything set in his mind. Nehemiah planned for the city. Now, if we're going to change an organization, you've got to change a structure, you've got to plan for it. See? We've got to start to think strategically, plan strategically. That means a good deal of research and fact-gathering before we, before we start. <clears throat> if you're going to change the city, the starting line is that you know the city better than anybody else that lives in it. Simple as that. We've got to make our plans. <clears throat> in Nehemiah's plans, he got these two important things. <clears throat> One, he got a big goal. Under Ezra, 50,000 Jews had gone back to Jerusalem. What 50,000 Jews in 70 years had failed to do, Nehemiah said, I'll do it. That's not bad, that's one man. What 50,000 Jews in 70 years, that's three and a half million man years, had failed to do, Nehemiah said, I'll do it. He got a big vision. And our vision has to be big. <clears throat> Think big, start small, but start by thinking big, see. I want to ask you something. Do you really believe you can stop a culture in its tracks and turn it back to God? Do you believe you can do that? Can you believe it can be done? Most of the church doesn't. 
Most of the church thinks you're just spitting against the wind. The only change we can expect is change for the worse. I do not believe that. I could not live with that. If that were true, we would have to confess that in the long run, redemption fails. That God has to bring in omnipotence to do what the blood of Jesus couldn't do. I couldn't live with that. I don't believe it. I believe we can stop a culture in its tracks and turn it back to God. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about redemptive change. And I believe until... See, there's, there's, something, there's something new beginning to emerge in the church of God. Hardly discernible yet, but it's there all right. See. And in many ways, it's as though you're in a football match that everybody believed you'd get plastered in. And you thought you'd get plastered. And you're halfway through the second half and the, there's no score on the board and the oddest of ideas are starting to emerge in the back of your head. We could actually win this. And some sections of the church are looking at the world today. You know what they're starting to think? We'd actually win this. We could actually take the world. We could actually redeem. We could actually fulfil the Great Commission. That's where it's got to begin. We've got to get a big vision. We haven't got a big vision. We'll be wiped out before we start, I believe. We'll be daunted. All those gleaming towers, all that power and might and oppression and all that stuff out there. Get a big vision. Secondly, (coughs) Nehemiah got a long-term goal, big vision, long-term goal. (coughs) In Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 6, in verse 5 says, uh, let him, him send me to the city in Judah so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. If you compare the time in Nehemiah chapter 2 with Nehemiah chapter, chapter 12, I think it is, you know how long the time was? 12 years. 12 years. 12 years before Nehemiah was back in, uh, in uh, Hanani, in the city, Susa. We have to be there for the long haul. My conviction is that the crunch point in most of our societies is roughly about 20 years ahead. That's why I don't think we need to be over-elated or over-despairing about any immediate uh, change in the political scene wherever it is, whether it's Australia or, or, or America or Britain or wherever. I think the crunch point is about 20 years ahead. I'll show you why I believe that. If you look at society today, <coughs> you'll find that generally the people who run things are between the age of 45 and 65. They're the controllers. Senior politicians, corporate heads, editors of newspapers, owners of television stations, trendsetters in societies, the dominant writers and so on, are generally between the ages of 45 and 65. I do not personally think there is very much chance of the present lot changing, apart from a sovereign intervention of God's grace. By the time you're 45 or 50, you're pretty well set in your ways. (coughs) But if you go into any church, and I'd recommend you do this, Uh, when you go back to your own church or wherever you are. If you go into any church where there is any spiritual life and say this, I've done it, I suppose, 12, 15 nations, probably more than that in recent years. Everybody here today between the ages of 20 or say late teens and 45 stand up. You'll get anything from 75% to 95% of your people standing up. I was in quite a big meeting in London, asked the question. Uh, I suppose there would have been at least 98% of the people stood up between the age of 20 and 45. That tells me this. <coughs> in 20 years' time, those people will be the controllers. See. 
And those of you who today are between the age of 20 and 45, the things you have to come to terms with, I believe, as far as your faith is concerned, is in 20 years' time, will you determine the shape of, of American society or will your peers? Because either you or your peer group today, who are sitting around, whatever they're, wherever they're sitting down, will be, the, will be the controllers in 20 years' time. And I, I sense there is a special message of God a special work of the Holy Spirit today operating in that kind of age group. And that to me is significant in terms of timing. Whether that is accurate or not, this is what I want to say. Are we prepared to spend our life for a goal that might take 20 years to achieve? Or 30 years to achieve? Or 50 years to achieve? Now, I do not know when Jesus is coming back. As far as I can see biblically, there's nothing to stop Jesus from coming back tomorrow if he so decides. See. But if he's not back, we've got to be here for the long haul. See. If it's going to take all my lifetime and the lifetime of my children, I've got to have a goal. See. I remember speaking to a, a Swedish businessman in, uh, some years ago. We were talking about the Zionists. I'm not quite sure how we got onto that subject. You know what I discovered? 35 years before the state of Israel came into being, the Zionists all that time had a shadow cabinet, had a shadow government. And for 35 years they discussed foreign policy, they discussed financial policy, they discussed how to run a country, they argued right, left and centre for 35 years. And when overnight in 1947 suddenly the, the State of Israel came into being, they had 35 years of detailed reflection on what they'd do if that took place. When I, when I discovered that, I thought this, what would happen in this nation, or Australia, or New Zealand, or Britain, if God answered the prayers of his people and said, right, revival you can have. Starting next Tuesday, turn this into a righteous nation. At every dimension of society, it's yours, go ahead and do it. We wouldn't know where to begin, see. We wouldn't know where to begin, see. Sometimes, and in some mission organizations, it seems to me people make a virtue about not knowing what they're going to do in six, six months' time, or a year's time, or whatever, see. Now, I'm not saying that God reveals to us a detailed plan for years ahead, but our goal's got to be longer than three months or six months. Eh? I think one of the most fulfilling times uh, I've had in my life was uh, three or four years ago at home when a couple of other brothers about my own age had a burden for younger leaders. We thought we'd like to get a bunch of them together and pray whatever anointing was on our life, pass on to them because we we're on the sideline now waving that lot on. See? So we let it be known we're going to have a house party I thought we'd get 30, 40 perhaps. We just wanted to pray for them. We didn't want to preach at them or teach them. You know, we'd over 200 turned up. Only one of them was over 35 years of age. We prayed for them all. And God started to show us what some of those young men and women will be in 20 years' time. Amazing. I've met a future Prime Minister of New Zealand amongst them. Of that, I'm convinced. I don't think he knows it yet, but I'm sure of it. Eh? Some of them will be national figures. Some will be international figures. I wasn't interested what's going to happen to them next year or two years, five, or 20 years down the track. See? We have to start thinking strategically. Don't understand what I'm saying? I think we have to start thinking generationally. See? What's going to happen if only your children are going to, going to enter into it? Now what has happened, I don't know about America, I suspect it may be the same. What's happened where I come from is that politicians have no vision. The furthest ahead they can look, the furthest ahead they speak these days is your retirement. They say, we are an aging population. You better make plans now for when you're 65, because when you're 65, the chances are the state won't be able to afford to give you a pension to look after. That's as far as they can look, see. Nobody talks these days about what kind of a nation we're leaving for our children or our children's children, see. What does Ezekiel say? Where there's no vision, people perish, see. There's no vision, people run amok. We've got to get a long-term goal, see. We've got to be here for the long haul, see. Nehemiah got it. He got a big vision. What, 50,000 Jews in 70 years couldn't do? He said, I'll do it. 12 years. <clears throat> Number four. Live in the city. The tragedy of so many believers is that we don't live in the city anymore. I don't mean physically, I mean emotionally. 
I mean mentally, psychologically, spiritually, we were treated from the city. Every Christian ought to read two things every morning. One is his Bible, the other is the morning newspaper. You can find a good morning newspaper. See. I'm serious, I'm not joking. See. We need not only to listen to what God's saying, we need to listen to what the city's saying. See. We're meant to stand between the living Savior and the dying people. See. And half the time I think we're, we're giving answers to things the city's not asking. And the real question they're asking, we, we haven't got answers for them. We never thought about them. See. We have to start to live in the city. I went through, in a town we lived in in New Zealand, I went through all the service clubs one time that I could find out in the, in the city. PTAs and football clubs and all sorts of stuff. And I went through trying to find the Christian presence amongst them. It was minimal. It was minimal, see. We've got to reverse that. We've left the city. We've abandoned the city. We've got to live in the city. I'm, <clears throat> I'm enormously interested these days in the biblical symbol of the little donkey. In ancient times, the donkey was the beast of burden. The donkey stands, I believe, for man's secular vocation. And when Jesus was going to go into a city, you know what he sent for? A little donkey, didn't he? Go into the village and find a donkey tied. Loose him and bring him to me. I believe Jesus wants to enter the secular city. He will not enter the secular city on the backs of preachers. Preachers don't understand the language of the city. The city doesn't understand the language of the preachers, for that matter. See. You go on the backs of businessmen, tradesmen, professional men and women. See. They understand the language of the city. It's interesting, in, in the Mosaic economy, the first fruits of everything belonged to God, had to be offered as a sacrifice. Only two things could be redeemed. You know what they were? One was the firstborn son. You know what the other was? The firstborn donkey. And the donkey had to be redeemed with a lamb, otherwise he had to break its neck. And I believe God is looking <coughs> for, for donkeys, for secular men and women with secular vocations to enter the city, to say to the city, lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up. The King of Glory wants to come in. Dan was mentioning <coughs> uh, earlier on the whole business of the spiritual aspects of business. I, I, I would like to underscore that. For example, if you're in business, you have to give before you get. Isn't that right? You have to invest your capital, produce your goods, set up your distribution system before you get anything back. That's faith, isn't it? You're, you're stepping out in faith. You have to give without any guarantee of getting. What's that? That's hope, isn't it? If you don't care for your customers and care for your staff and care for your product, you're heading for your first bankruptcy. What's care? Care is love and action. See? In other words, you can't run a business without faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. See? Let me just ask you something else. This is just an interesting aside. A lot of emphasis these days in some circles about the restoration of the... Uh, Ascension gift ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. I believe in that too. Only I think we're looking in the wrong place for them. See. I think we're looking in the church for them. I'm not. I'm looking for apostolic figures in the political scene. Apostolic men and women, prophetic men and women in business and education. I can see some of them too emerging. If you're running a business, <coughs> which of those Ascension gift ministries would you, would you give the job of CEO? Founder? Apostle, eh? Who would, you, who would you look for for a sales manager? Evangelist. How about a corporate planner? Prophet, eh? Human resource management? Pastor? Communication and systems? Teacher? What am I saying? Don't draw a rigid line between the spiritual and the secular. They flow into one another. Okay. Live in the city. Nehemiah went into Jerusalem, and by the time, the time he'd been there for a very short space of time, he knew Jerusalem and its problems better than anybody else that lived there. <coughs> I 
Nehemiah saw the problems of Jerusalem, but he saw them with the objective eye of an outsider who wasn't conditioned to them. That was a problem in Jerusalem. They got used to the state of things around about them. Broken down walls? Well, walls are always broken down. See, You don't have a wall that's not broken down. That's just the way they are. They grow like that. See, Gates? Well, they've got to be burned because they've got a good colour. Everybody's gates burned. Who ever heard of a gate that's not burned? They got used to that for 70 years. Nehemiah comes in and he sees what they saw is just the normal environment. He's always a disgrace. He'd look at the disgrace we're in. He saw things with the objective eye of a newcomer. No rationalizations, no excuses. But secondly, more importantly, he saw the problem from the perspective of somebody who believed something could be done about it. See. They could be, the gates could be rebuilt, the walls could be restored. See. And when we're living in the city, we have to see the, city, the city's problems with clear eyes. Because most of the city's got used to those problems. They have given up almost totally on any prospect of changing them. All they're doing is trying to, to minimize the damage, isn't that right? See? To kind of hold the line. See? I believe the city has long since despaired of finding any solutions for any of its problems out there, from homelessness to drug addiction and AIDS and all the rest. See? All they're doing now is somehow try to contain it. See? We need to see those things or see the problems the way they are, but from the perspective that believes that something can be done about them, they can be changed. See? That was Nehemiah's perspective. Number six. <clears throat> Start a movement. All organizational change, small or great, begins with a movement. The charismatic renewal in its beginnings, at least in the country I come from, was a movement. It was a totally lay movement operating at grassroots. There were no ministers involved, no pastors involved. It was a totally lay movement spontaneously sprung up under the impetus of the Spirit of God. I can remember in the early 1960s being hauled up in front of a bunch of Pentecostal ministers and told, what you're into, Tom, is not of God. If it was of God, you'd come to us to run it because you don't know your way around that. I mean, this hindsight, the arrogance is unbelievable. That was their honest opinion, see. No ministers involved at all, see. It was a movement. All social change begins with a movement. Now, here's the important things about a, things about a movement. You do not need to be in a majority to start a movement. All movements begin small. I think we have misunderstood the remnant theology in the Bible. As though all God is content with is to save a remnant. That's not what the message is. The message is all God needs is a remnant. See. All God needs is a committed handful. See. A movement always starts small, and it begins with a small number of people <coughs> who believe it's possible to make real change in this in a situation. And once a movement is underway, and once a movement begins to grow, it develops a momentum of its own. And once it has developed a momentum, it is unstoppable, short of massive physical force. Nehemiah began a movement. And all movements, all social movements that have affected change in, in cultures, have had these characteristics. Number one, they go for radical change, not cosmetic change. And they know the difference. And two, they're based on a religious type commitment. I read that in the book of sociology. All movements that have changed the culture are based on a radical commitment rather than cosmetic change. And they know the difference and they're based on a religious type commitment. Here's what Nehemiah did to start his movement. Number one, he found the influencers. In any group of people, including this one here, 
there are certain people who are more influential than others. If we're just in a gathering here uh, this afternoon, uh, there are certain people here, if they started a conversation, that would set the tone, that would set the theme. Other people, if they start a conversation, people will probably ignore the question and go on to something else. And the first lot of the influencers, the ones who s automatically take, take charge of things. Nehemiah found the influencers, find the influential people. Now, if you're changing an organisation of any size, that's where you've got to begin. If you can influence the influencers, they will influence the rest on your behalf. The inner life of an organisation <coughs> or a culture of a company or a church are built on these things. Number one, shared values. Not the official shared values, but the shared values to which the people respond. If you want to find out what the shared values of a place are, ask this question. What do you need to do to get on here? You'll discover what the values of the place are. What are the things people talk most about here? What do people spend most of their money on here? What brings the biggest attendance to this place here? Those are the real shared values. They may not be the official ones on the, on the uh, uh, Constitution or whatever, but what holds the glue that holds an organization together are the shared values in the place. Therefore, if you're going to change the inner life of an organization, you have to modify the shared values. You need to know what the present ones are. You need to know what shifts uh, uh, you, you mean to, to, uh, to make in them. Secondly, you need heroes. Heroes are people who personify the shared values and who are passionate about the shared values. All heroes have passion. That's what drives them. See. One of the great lacks in the church of God today in many places is just that passion. See. A poem written a number of years ago by the Irish poet W.B. Yeats has a couple of lines that have stuck in my memory for years. The poem is called The Second Coming. It's got a couple of lines that says this, The good lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. In society today, there's more passion on the side of evil than there's on the side of good. See? Now, heroes are people who passionately embrace certain values, and because they passionately embrace them, they personify them. They set models, role models for people. See? And we need some heroes. And the third thing are rituals. Rituals are expressive events again, that reinforce or personify the values of the culture. That illustrate things like how success is rewarded, how entry is recognized, how you get into the organization, how the shared values are celebrated from, such, from time to time. Now, that's the way, that's the way an inner culture is, is formed. And you'll find these people critical to that the application of that, the influences. So Nehemiah gets hold of the influences. Nehemiah chapter 2, you've got the priests, the nobles and the officials together. Secondly, having got the influences, he got them to face the problem. And if we're going to recover the city, we're going to begin a movement for change, those people have to face the problem realistically. How many of you in uh, uh, partway through Dan's talk this morning were finding the reaction in your heart, I don't want to hear any more of that kind of stuff. You know, that's, uh, forget about that, let it pass. I found it in me. You know, that, 
But that's, 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 that, that's, that's, the, that's the way things really are, see? And we've got to face the problems. Nehemiah said, you see the disgrace we are in. Look, Jerusalem's walls are broken down. I mean, they'd lived there for years, those people. They never recognized. They'd long since realized the state they were in. And the walls are burnt, the gates are burnt with fire. Face it, see, face it. See. Face the problem. Thirdly, he gave them a vision. A vision for change. There was something burning in Nehemiah's heart, been burning in, in Nehemiah's heart for months. By the time Nehemiah got here, if you read the story, he had already made the critical decisions that committed resources to actually do it. He'd ordered the timber and stuff to arrive on the spot. If the influencers didn't take it on, I, I think Nehemiah would have started on his own. He was committed to that. He had a vision. And he got the people together, he got them to face the problem, but the vision that was in his heart, he managed to impart to them. See, he, out of his spirit, he, parted, he planted that vision into their, into, into their spirit. Gave them a vision. Number four. And this is true about vision generally. Get them to buy into it. Nehemiah didn't want them to say, well, we agree with you, Nehemiah, it's a good idea for the walls to be rebuilt. He didn't even want them to say, we will give you a hand from time to time, Nehemiah, if you get started, we'll see you don't run out of, of support. He wanted them to do it, see. And he got them to buy into the vision so it became not Nehemiah's vision, but their vision, see. They said, let's build it. Let's build it. Number seven, foster the movement. One inspirational meeting is not going to be enough. Here are the characteristics that uh, Nehemiah had to, had to encourage. Number one, personal commitment by individuals who believed they could change their immediate environment. If you read Nehemiah chapter 3, it doesn't seem there was any great organization involved in rebuilding Jerusalem. Just some people who said, well, look, this wall outside our place, we're sick of that, we'll fix it, and they actually did it. Personal commitment to change their immediate environment. Secondly, <laughs> The recruitment of friends and colleagues for small-scale winnable opportunities. So their neighbours came along and said, if you fix that bit, boy, I can do this bit. Somebody else said, if you can do that bit, look, I'll take it right to the end where the gate is. So on. If you look back, I look back a lot these days at the beginning of the charismatic renewal. That's exactly the way the renewal operated. See? A few people who discovered that God could really radically change their lives, and their lives were changed. And they got hold, of, got hold of their friends. Look, God can change this. God's changed this in me. What about you? And their lives were changed. See? Then you've got a movement underway. Number three. The expectation of and the willingness to face opposition from the establishment. Here's one of the marvelous things about a movement. Opposition only strengthens it. I couldn't count the number of people in the early days of the renewal in New Zealand who came into things of the Holy Spirit because they were warned against it. Is that your experience? These dangerous people to be around, people come out of curiosity and wondering, well, why, why am I not supposed to come here? What's going on here? See? Opposition only strengthens the movement. See. Now, if we're, going to tackle this, if we're going to tackle the city, there's going to be opposition. We need realistically to expect there's going to be opposition. If 
from the powers that are being threatened. And remember, people are never the, never the enemy. The opposition may come through people, but people are never the enemy, not the enemy. It's a superhuman level or a supernatural level where the enemy is. The enemy is. Expectation of opposition. Number four, the willingness to go for radical and not peripheral change. The willingness to go for radical and not peripheral or cosmetic change. I've mentioned this before, but you can put it down here too. And the ability to know the difference. Even then, Nehemiah is not finished. Even when the movement is underway, you need to reiterate, restate, reinforce the vision. People have to be encouraged, motivated, corrected, sometimes disciplined. <coughs> and finally, and we need to bear this in mind, after radical change, there is a need for re-education. The first six chapters of Nehemiah deal with the rebuilding of the city, of the city walls, rather. The last six chapters deal with reforming its character. And in many ways, that's the heart of the two jobs. So chapter 7 is reorganizing the life of the city. Chapter 8 is reprogramming the mind of the city. Chapter 9 are the principles of continuous revival for the city. Chapter 10, the principle of separation. Chapter 11, the principle of occupation. Chapter 12, the principle of dedication. What's Nehemiah do? He's re-educating the life of the city. And chapter 13, the last chapter, is a reminder that in this life the job will never ever be permanently done. There's always the possibility of backsliding. Now, could I just finish very quickly with a couple of things about the future of the city? When we start speaking in these terms, generally you'll find the minds of people start up, uh, applying it to alternative end-time eschatologies. I think, personally, that's looking the wrong way. I'm not concerned about how that fits pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial, or, or whatever. I'm more concerned about going back to the cross and say what was accomplished at the cross. But here's what I want to, want to point out. If you look at God's dealings with the individual, after conversion, it has two dimensions. One is God's continuous dealings. That is the work of sanctification. We are being conformed more and more to the image of God's Son. A continual, year by year, day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, work of the Holy Spirit. So you're more like Jesus today than you were this time 12 months ago. 